Good day uh, and welcome to everybody who's listening in. Uh, my name is Tim Dixon, uh, Technical Program Manager of the IEA Greenhouse Gas R&D Programme and I'd like to welcome you to our 10th webinar in our series. This webinar on CAM CCS Unlock and Burnable Carbon. Uh, and this one, um, it, it's an interesting topic, we've had a lot of interest in this. There's an example of where we see a topic that arises that um, we can see uh, issues around that we can address with our technical program. Uh, we've seen this topic arising over the last two years with the Bank of England, in UNFCCC, with the Carbon Disclosure Task Force that Mark Carney set up at COP21. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the, um, of course, ourselves are part of the International Energy Agency's Energy Technology Network since 1991. We exist because of our members, uh, thank you very much to them, and our members set the strategic direction and the, and the technical direction of our program. And as such, we are an R&D organization, technically based, we don't define policy, and we do policy relevant work, uh, but we are not advocates for any particular technology or solution. Um, our main roles are really looking at mitigation options for reducing greenhouse gases from the use of fossil fuels and tracking the various captured and monitoring and storage technology developments. Our main outputs are our technical reports and this webinar is based on one of those. Um, and uh, our main conference is the GHGT conference and I'm very pleased that we have GHGT, GHGT 13 um, is coming up quickly in about four weeks from the 14th to the 18th of November in Lausanne well, we'll have 341 uh, presentations and over 600 posts and presentations at that. Uh, and these are our members. Thank you very much to them for their support. And around the outside of this slide just shows that our technical work, we are keen to make sure that it's used where needed. And so we are active in these environments, noting particularly the UNFCCC at the bottom, where we have our side events with our collaborators, our side event on the 8th of November on CCS Opportunities for Africa. And that's a UNFCCC official uh, side event. And anybody who attends, you're very welcome to attend. So uh, this piece of work we're very pleased to do and um, work with the Sustainable Gas Institute at the at Imperial College. Um, and uh, we've worked with them and supported them in the production of this study. I'd like now to introduce uh, Dr. Yasmin Kemper um, from our team here. She's a project manager at IAGHG. Uh, she joined us in 2011. And Yasmin really uh, picks up a sort of range of areas um, and has become our expert on subjects such as BioCCS, on hubs and clusters, on LCA issues, on greenhouse gas accounting, on CO2 utilization. Um, and he has been originally uh, came to us from the University of Bochum in Germany, where she got her PhD in combustion and capture uh, amine properties. So I'd now like to hand over to Yasmin to talk to us about CAM, CCS, Unlock and Vulnerable Carbon. Thank you, Yasmin. Yes, Tim. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for listening in to our webinar. And... Uh, We'll first give you uh, a bit of an overview about uh, what to expect in the next half an hour. So I will first present uh, uh, the results of the study SGI did for us uh, on uh, whether uh, carbon capture and storage uh, technologies can unlock unburnable carbon. Then I will uh, put that into a bit wider context of the uh, challenge we are currently facing uh, to limiting uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees as uh, uh, supported by the uh, Paris Agreement, and then give you some uh, overall conclusions and some slight recommendations. So uh, as Tim already mentioned, uh, uh, this study uh, was a uh, um, was uh, commissioned by us to the uh, Sustainable Gas Institute at Imperial College London, and the aim of this was to assess the relevance of CCS in terms of unburnable carbon and whether CCS can unlock fossil fuel reserves. And uh, so they first started out uh, investigating this for us, but since then uh, it has also moved on into a larger exercise. So they have done a bit of follow-on work 
on this uh, and published uh, another white paper on the topic. And both our report and uh, their white paper, you can download them uh, during um, using the following links. And what you might also have noticed uh, in your webinar panel is that there is a handout. So the executive summary from our study, if you already want to have a look at that, you can jump directly to it and uh, yeah, go through the material and the uh, main messages again. So first a bit of an introduction with regards to the terminology that we are using. So there are several um, uh, terms popping up, uh, especially in the media recently, such as unburnable carbon. But what actually do we understand uh, under unburnable carbon? And unburnable carbon is usually uh, understood as the uh, fossil fuel energy sources, which should not be burned, and their greenhouse gases not emitted if the world is to adhere to a given carbon budget. And uh, other concepts that are mentioned uh, in relation to unburnable carbon are the so-called stranded assets, that's uh, fossil fuel energy and generation resources which, at some time prior to the end of their economic life, are no longer able to earn an economic return as a result, for example, of changes in the market or the regulatory environment. And what's also related to uh, this is uh, the carbon bubble concept. And uh, this refers to the idea that there is a bubble in valuation of companies related to fossil fuel-based energy production. What has to be stressed in this uh, context is that all of these are concepts. And uh, we know that there are different opinions out there whether these concepts are actually realistic or not. And also what implications those concepts would have on maybe real-world um, operations. So uh, also important to stress that in the work I present, we focused on unburnable carbon only. So we, we or SGI did not do a detailed analysis of those even maybe more debatable concepts such as stranded assets or carbon bubble. Now a bit more to uh, the background uh, of the work we did. So it all started with realizing that uh, the global carbon budget is constrained and this would then mean that if we would burn all known and accessible fossil reserves, we would likely not be able to keep the temperature rise too well below 2 degrees C. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, those concepts such as unburnable carbon, stranded assets, and the carbon bubble are raising more and more concerns also in the financial sector. And uh, yeah, because they might have an impact on the valuation of fossil fuel companies or the financial stability. And you might have also heard in the news that there are large divestment campaigns going on with lots of universities and NGOs trying to yeah, divest from fossil fuel companies. Um, our mother organization, the IEA, and also the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change both expect CCS, that's carbon capture and storage, to preserve uh, the economic value of fossil fuels in the future. So that's also one reason why we have an interest in uh, um, investigating this topic further. And there were uh, also some papers suggesting uh, that CCS might not play a significant role in providing any longer or more access to fossil fuel uh, resources. And those uh, um, studies also refer that there are limitations in CO2 storage and also that CCS availability might be limited before 2050. So we also wanted to look deeper into are those limitations uh, really true or do we think or do we find some evidence that it might be different. And so we thought there was a need to review CO2 storage capacity, the status of CCS, and also the impact uh, of CCS on fossil fuel reserves. So maybe uh, for those of you who are maybe not so deep uh, into the uh, carbon capture and storage uh, uh, community, what is CCS? CCS means carbon capture and storage and it's usually the process of capturing, transporting and permanently storing CO2 emissions from anthropogenic large point sources. You can have uh, different capture technologies such as pre-combustion, post-combustion, or oxy-fuel combustion, or also non-combustion related uh, capture uh, from other industrial processes. Then you usually have the transport of the captured CO2, either by pipeline or by ship. And at the end, you usually have storage, 
uh, in, for example, a depleted oil and gas field or a deep saline aquifer, or you could also use it uh, for enhanced oil recovery. And during enhanced oil recovery, uh, almost all of the CO2 is then also over the lifetime of the project stored underground. Uh, what's uh, important to note is that all parts of the CCS chain are technically feasible. However, there remain some issues with the costs, the public perception, and also with um, integrating all those parts into a large-scale project. Uh, currently, there are 15 uh, projects with around 29 million tons of CO2 per year in operation, and uh, seven additional projects are under construction, which will add around 11 million tons of CO2 per year. So, uh, uh, the authors uh, at uh, SGI, uh, when first looking into this, started with a literature review on the uh, global greenhouse gas budgets. And uh, from this uh, slide, you can see um, that uh, uh, the budgets uh, for, uh, tend to uh, range depending on what assumptions or which model you use and whether, for example, you include aerosols or you don't include aerosols. And uh, you can also see that uh, uh, for the different models, uh, some of them only consider uh, CO2 as a greenhouse gas, and some of the models then also set out to include all of the so-called Kyoto gases, which also include uh, CH4, N2H, HFCs, PFCs, and SF6. And um, the uh, percentages uh, that you see on the uh, x-axis, that actually means um, uh, the probability to exceed uh, 2 degrees C. So, for example, if you pick uh, uh, the first uh, column on the very far left, you can see that even with a greenhouse gas budget of slightly below 1,000 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, you would still have a 20% chance of exceeding the 2 degree scenario. And of course, if you allow for a higher carbon uh, budget or CO2 equivalent budget, then you would have uh, an even higher probability to exceed the 2 degrees C. Also, what I found uh, uh, very uh, thought-provoking is, uh, or are the two columns on the right side. They come from a model uh, that uh, investigated a larger time frame than the, all, than the others. The others were usually from 2000 to 2050, but this covered the whole industrial age, so to speak, from 1750 to 2500. Therefore, of course, the uh, the budget is much larger than for the other uh, studies. And uh, you can see that uh, the shaded uh, column, that's what we have already um, remaining after 2009. So we have already used up uh, quite, uh, yeah, maybe half of the budget. And this, uh, with the current emissions rate, which is around 40 gigatons of CO2 per year, this uh, makes it important uh, uh, to stress we need timely action on this. Uh, further literature review from studies uh, identifying which uh, amount of the carbon budget would be burnable or unburnable uh, is, can be shown on the following slide. And uh, you see that most of the studies uh, seem to more or less agree on the total uh, carbon budget except for the top one from McLeod and Ekins, which accounts for a bit uh, higher budget, but that there is a, yeah, no agreement about the uh, share of uh, unburnable carbon. And uh, this uh, is giving you uh, the breakdown for the first study, which also looked at what does unburnable and burnable carbon mean for the different fossil fuels. So here you have the breakdown for coal, gas, and oil. And you can see and uh, that, for example, for coal, unburnable carbon seems to be a much uh, larger issue, for example, than for gas and oil. And this is uh, partly due to uh, the carbon content or the different carbon content of the uh, fossil fuels. So uh, uh, the study on unburnable carbon first uh, uh, set out to review the global volumetric CO2 storage potential 
Because if you think of CCS, one of the first questions that always comes up is, do we actually have enough storage available to uh, put that as CO2 away? And uh, the review by the authors from SGI uh, uh, resulted in that sufficient uh, storage capacity is available for at least the first generation of CCS. That means up to 2050. But uh, also cautioned that more dynamic estimates of CO2 storage capacity are necessary. And also that uh, um, it will be important to include a pressure and brine management strategies and their potentially added cost in uh, integrated assessment models. So uh, now to the approach for um, evaluating uh, the effect uh, of CCS on unburnable carbon. Um, we choose to do a model comparison. This is mainly because integrated assessment models are very suitable for analyzing this concept because they cover uh, a large variety of technologies and also they usually have a large geographical scope and they usually include both economic and climate data. And uh, so the authors choose uh, to uh, have a more detailed look at the Energy Modeling Forum at Stanford University. That is a model intercomparison exercise where 18 different of those IEAMs uh, were investigated. And uh, the, those 18 different IEMs were chosen especially because they were suitable uh, to, um, to uh, energy uh, technologies. And also this uh, EMF exercise figured already prominently in AR5, which made large reference to them. And um, during that uh, model comparison exercise, uh, uh, we chose to uh, focus on three technology scenarios. That is first the full tech scenarios, which means uh, the full portfolio of technologies and scale-up is available. The second scenario is uh, conventional, which um, has a limitation of renewables. That means it has a higher fossil fuel use than the full tech scenario. And the no CCS scenario. So that is a, is a scenario where CCS would never become available. So now to the outcomes of this uh, uh, model intercomparison. You can see here the uh, CO2 capture rates uh, for those uh, different scenarios. Um, for a 450 ppm and a 550 ppm scenario. A 450 ppm scenario is uh, uh, thought to be equivalent to a 2 degrees uh, of global warming. And uh, 550 would be exceeding the, uh, the uh, 2 degrees. And uh, what was found during the exercise was that uh, many models do not limit the, uh, the CO2 storage rate or the capacity. And it was also found that only four models could achieve the 550 ppm scenario without CCS. So that's also quite a clear message. And that underlines the importance of uh, CCS technologies regarding energy flexibility. And uh, you might also note that the CO2 kept rate in the 550 ppm scenario is lower than in the 550 ppm. So this might sound or appear strange at first, but if you look at uh, what's behind it, this is mainly due to limitations in bio-CCS and biomass supply. And also it might be due to some residual emissions from CCS. Uh, usually CCS uh, uh, is uh, operating at a 90% capture at most from the source. But even under those uh, constraint scenarios, it might be necessary to don't allow for this uh, residual emissions uh, to occur. But that's a, a topic that needs uh, further investigation and confirmation. And I will come back to that a bit later. And the next slide uh, is also from that model uh, intercomparison and shows you the uh, primary uh, energy for uh, each of uh, the scenarios under a 450 ppm assumption. And it also shows you on the right side uh, uh, the shares of the fossil fuels uh, for 2050 and 2100 as a snapshot. And the main uh, messages uh, from that uh, evaluation were that uh, the utilization of fossil fuels decreases in all scenarios over time. 
And you can also note that from around 2030 onwards, there is a significant impact of CCS on fossil fuel use, and this is especially true for coal. And uh, you can also note uh, by the error bars uh, in the uh, in the graph that the range of outcomes is of the models is large. So diff all these different models have different assumptions, though of course they produce different outcomes. And the solid lines should just say what the average from all those models is. So and uh, maybe the most important slide of results uh, from uh, uh, the study SGI did for us was. Uh, uh, quantifying the impact of CCS on unburnable carbon under a two degree scenario. And here you see uh, the first, uh, the, the upper part is for uh, up to 2050 and the uh, lower part for 2100. And up to 2050 uh, you can actually see what the percentage of fossil fuel reserves uh, CCS can unlock. And you can see that CCS uh, is able to unlock around 390 gigatons of CO2 more than scenarios without CCS. That's actually an increase of around 40%. And this effect becomes even greater up to 2100, uh, where uh, CCS uh, can unlock an additional 50%. So, Coming back to the uh, to the IEM intercomparison and uh, uh, some reasons uh, why those models have variations regarding CCS. This is mainly due that they have different assumptions for fuel prices, baseline emissions. They use different types of models. Technology change might be represented differently, and uh, it's usually uh, not always possible to clearly associate a specific assumption in the model with a capture rate. So it's hard to find out if I exactly change this assumption, how will that affect the capture rate or will it have an effect? But uh, also uh, the news from the uh, exercise was uh, that there in the models there seems to be no limit on uptake of it technologies. So um, uh, there were two main key messages and you can also call them a hypothesis. Uh, the first would be that costs and supply chain uh, issues do not limit the uptake of CCS. But, uh, yeah, it was observed that there is a, a limit. And so the second uh, hypothesis is uh, that the residual emissions I talked uh, about earlier from CCS could limit uh, its rollout in a very carbon-constrained world. But uh, the testing of this... Uh, uh, hypothesis uh, was outside the scope uh, of the study, but uh, uh, is an uh, important area for clarification in the future. And uh, in their white paper, uh, SGI looked actually a bit more into those residual emissions, and they used the uh, TM Grantham uh, model to uh, investigate the sensitivity uh, to CO2 capture rate, as you can see here on those on this slide. And uh, uh, the graph is uh, for gas, for natural gas, and uh, this shows that until 2050 the capture rate is not uh, very uh, uh, important, but from around uh, 2080 onwards, uh, high capture rates, and that means capture rates in excess of 96%, can almost double the primary energy supply. And uh, when they did uh, the same um, uh, analysis for coal and oil, they found that both do not show such significant sensitivity to the capture rate. So this uh, actually confirms that even low levels of residual emissions could conflict with highly carbon constrained scenarios. And uh, another uh, um, question that is related to this, uh, if I increase the capture rate, what does that actually mean in terms of cost? Mostly you would expect uh, you would have an increase in cost because it's harder to capture the last bits. But an IEHG report uh, in uh, 2014 um, on CO2 capture at coal-based power and hydrogen plants showed that uh, increasing the capture rate from 90 to 98 percent does not increase uh, the cost per ton of CO2 avoided for oxyfuel and uh, integrated gasification combined cycle of power plants. So uh, a quick summary of the findings uh, from this study. Um, 
yeah, uh, from the study, we can see that CCS enables access to significant quantities of CO2 from fossil fuels in a 2 degree C world, and that the impact uh, of CCS on unburnable carbon is significant, and uh, starting from around 2030, 2040, but becoming uh, more and more apparent uh, by the end uh, of the century. Uh, we saw that cost assumptions do not limit CCS uptake in integrated assessment models, but there seem to be other factors that limit uh, CCS uptake, and uh, residual emissions were identified as maybe the main uh, factor. And uh, we also found that uh, global volumetric CO2 storage capacity is large and above known fossil fuel reserves, so should be sufficient for the first generation of CCS and that if required, pressure and brine management uh, will likely induce higher cost, and this needs to be reflected in, in uh, the integrated assessment models. So now to uh, put uh, uh, those concepts like uh, unburnable carbon maybe in a bit uh, uh, greater context is how do we actually approach the 1.5 degrees challenge? So if you s s uh, follow the graph on the left, uh, which uh, is uh, from the Global Carbon Project, you see the different scenarios and you see accordingly the temperatures to, to which they refer. So um, if you see the yellow line, this would averagely bring us to a, a two degree scenario. And um, you see then how over uh, time the emissions from fossil fuels and cement need to go down to uh, reach those uh, uh, those two degrees. If you look at the blue curve, which is for, on average, below two degrees C, and 1.5 degrees would be one of those blue lines, you see that uh, towards the end of the century, you actually need net negative emissions to limit uh, the global warming. and yeah, so they appear to be crucial. And uh, what's related to this uh, is the carbon balance of energy systems, which you can see on this slide. And you see that uh, usually fossil fuels have a positive carbon balance. Fossil fuels with CCS can make those uh, systems less positive. If you want to have around neutral um, systems, you would need to go to renewable energy, bioenergy, or nuclear energy. Usually they have some uh, slightly residual uh, emissions left because they have supply chains or inefficiencies. And if you really want to go to negative emissions, you have to apply technologies similar as uh, bioenergy with CCS or other negative emission technologies. And I think the problem that we have is that our past and current energy system was based on the far left. We now have efforts underway to uh, apply the MIT-3 technologies like fossils with CCS, bioenergy, renewables, like wind and solar. But the question really is, should we stop here or do we need to go one step further to the right? And I think we need this because uh, we need to make up for all the emissions we have put up in the atmosphere in the past. So what are negative emission technologies? Um, I've uh, summarized uh, the most important ones on this slide. So we have, and I've underlined this because we have done a lot of work on this, uh, bio-CCS or BECS, which is bioenergy with CCS. That means you use biomass that has previously taken up CO2 during the growth to produce power, heat or fuels. Then you capture the CO2 from those conversion processes and store the emitted CO2 underground similar as to conventional CCS. There is uh, afforestation and reforestation where you plant trees where there were none before or where you have cut them down before. Uh, we have direct air capture with CCS uh, where you don't capture from a flue or industrial uh, gas but uh, directly from the air which has its own challenges because of to, due to the dilute nature of CO2 in the atmosphere. We have enhanced weathering, mineral carbonation, soil organic carbon sequestration, biochar and also some more uh, geoengineering approaches like ocean fertilization or cloud and ocean treatment. And uh, for example, I won't go into too much detail on bio-CCS, although I would like, 
but uh, unfortunately uh, we have only so much time today. But if you're interested in BioCCS, we have a special BioCCS uh, webinar, and you can uh, see the recording at the link provided here in the presentation. So if we look at the potentials for negative emission technologies, um, uh, it's apparent if we want to limit to 1.5 degrees, we might need quite a significant amount of negative emissions. I found ranges in the literature somehow between 500 and 1,000 gigatons of CO2. And if we would start tomorrow, that would mean we would need somewhere between 6 and 12 gigatons per year. And you can now see here on the slide uh, what's the currently estimated potential for all those uh, negative emission technologies. You can also see it, uh, it might uh, not be easy to, uh, if you refer maybe to the lower ranges of the potentials, let's be a bit uh, uh, cautious in this case you might not be able to achieve that with one of the technologies you might uh, or uh, approaches you might need uh, several of them and also um, they have trade-offs so they all have a more or less impact on soil on albedo on costs they have different energy water and land demands so um, some examples are for the same amount of negative emissions if you want to reach that with bags you would need quite a large amount of land However, if you look at afforestation, reforestation, you would need at least the same amount of land, if not more, and you will also change the albedo. If you would do it through boreal afforestation, that means you might cause a net warming. So there are trade-offs, and those need to be taken into account when assessing which technologies to choose. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, land availability um, is a very important uh, topic and how could we actually overcome the lack of uh, the land. And I've just been to a, a conference uh, uh, organized by the University of Oxford on 1.5 degrees challenge. And it becomes more and more apparent that uh, um, we also need to address demand side changes. It's not about just uh, applying technologies anymore. We we also need to uh, address the demand side because that can also free land. So if we would reduce the waste or shift diets, that could, for example, in turn then free land for afforestation or backs. So now to the overall conclusion. Yeah, due to the quick erosion of the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degree scenario, Timely action is really required. Um, CCS technology components are mature and CCS can enable, as we have seen in our study with uh, SGI, continued access to fossil fuels under carbon constraint scenarios. Negative emission technologies like bio-CCS could make up for residual as well as historic emissions. Uh, however, a mitigation portfolio containing various options is likely the best bet, as each uh, option has its uh, pros and cons. And uh, similar to uh, the financial market, it's usually better to spread out the risks. And uh, what becomes more and more apparent, if you especially look at things like bio-CCS, that whole system approaches are required uh, to address the uh, so-called food, water, energy, climate nexus, because if you take action uh, in one of those areas, it will usually affect the others as well. And that's also the reason why I brought these uh, 1.5 negative emissions on here, because I think it's not only about uh, uh, fossil fuels and unburnable carbon anymore. We have to see everything in the bigger context and also the question to what extent could the bio CCS actually preserve fossil fuels if we switch or co-fire biomass then that would also have an effect uh, maybe on the prolonged uh, use of fossil fuels and then we also have some uh, recommendations uh, um, it would be good to evaluate more or to quantify the role of CCS and negative emission technologies on unburnable carbon especially under 1.5 degree scenarios and uh, um, yeah, maybe some more analysis uh, on the residual emissions topic and how that would need to be considered in integrated assessment models. What I said before, we need more dynamic uh, estimates of CO2 storage capacity and uh, the inclusion of the pressure and brine management strategies, if they are applicable. 
and uh, also to identify the sweet spots for fossil CCS and also negative emission technology implementation. And this goes, of course, hand in hand with the development of financial mechanisms and policy frameworks that support both CCS and negative emission technologies. And with this, I would like to thank you uh, and uh, again like to acknowledge uh, 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 the work of our contractors, especially the Sustainable Gas Institute at Imperial College London. And then the last thing I want to do is draw your attention to uh, our conference again. As Tim already mentioned, uh, uh, the GHGT is uh, about uh, to come, registration is open, and the topics we've uh, discussed in this webinar will also be present at our conference. So, for example, uh, Sarah Boudini, who was the lead author uh, of the uh, SGI work on unburnable carbon, will give a presentation there as well in the Wednesday session on policies. But there are also two sessions on negative emission technologies, and there will also be a uh, IEA bioenergy workshop. So if you are more interested in digging deeper into those topics, we would be happy to see you there. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin. Um, so I should have said at the beginning, please, uh, any questions, use the um, facility for sending your questions in online. Uh, we've got one question on um, follow-on work. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what follow-on work is planned by either ourselves, IAGHG, or by others? Yes. Uh, um, I mean, one follow-on work item uh, was already done by SGI that was looking deeper into the uh, residual emissions. So they started on that and have uh, reported the results I have shown in their white paper. I'm not sure if there is more further work uh, planned on their side, but uh, IEAG, IEAGHG has also plans uh, to uh, um, do more investigation of the residual emissions related to the capture rate and uh, how it is will or how it will be possible to increase the capture rate uh, of uh, CCS uh, processes. So it's definitely on, on, our, on our work agenda. Okay, good, thank you. Another question. Um, with the IPCC uh, um, special report on 1.5 degrees C, yeah. do, do you have any, um, do you know if this, their scope, I think, which has been developed, mm -hmm. uh, will include much of this and the negative emission technologies and the other aspects you've just described? Yes, I mean, so as far as I've seen uh, the scope on their website, um, they have one chapter on mitigation options, and mitigation options would include CCS, bio-CCS, other negative emission technologies. So especially the negative emission technologies, I think, will get uh, uh, more focus than in the past in uh, AR5, because... Uh, under 1.5 degrees, the carbon budget is so constrained, you would actually need them. I mean, I've seen at that conference uh, someone presenting from the more from the agricultural uh, sector, saying that even if we decarbonize under 1.5, the whole electricity, energy, transport sector, the emissions from food, for example, would still blow the carbon budget. So, it's uh, really important, uh, yeah, to, now to realize that we have to work uh, on all ends. Okay. Um, just an observation on that. Uh, I think yeah. those points that have kind of come up in the 1.5 working group, um, the Japanese hosted their Innovation for Cool Earth Forum uh, yeah. last week, and in the o opening panels on that, the emphasis was on negative emission technologies, yeah. in particular CCS with biomass yeah, think, uh, and afforestation yeah. and reforestation as the two main options that needed to be addressed. Yeah, I think also the uh, Japanese are currently pursuing their first uh, bio-CCS uh, large-scale project, so they will be very keen and interested to follow that up and when that comes online. Yeah. Okay. Um, we don't seem to have any more questions um, arising. Um, any right. further points that you'd like to add, um, Yasmin? Uh, I would only add well, with the uh, importance of the uh, 1.5 uh, degrees uh, challenge that every researcher who has anything related to that challenge to submit it to IPCC, get involved in the report, get their research published and 
uh, submitted to the uh, lead authors or even uh, volunteer as a lead author themselves and to get involved so that we yeah, have the best assessment possible on our options for 1.5. Okay. Well, with that, th thank you very much, Yasmin. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to all of the uh, you listening and for the, uh, the questions we've had in. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, uh, please send them in by email and we will respond to those in writing. And to mention also that our next webinar will be next week, uh, Wednesday the 19th, uh, which will be on our cost network and Howard Herzog will be presenting on that. And an email notification will go out uh, in due course on that. So again, thank you very much for listening and watching and I hope this was uh, of interest to you. Thank you.